Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's March 2021, and you're listening to Episode 227, which is a spoiler-filled discussion about the Disney Plus Marvel television series, WandaVision. On this episode, I'm joined by Cole Burgett, who's a recent seminary graduate and an author for the website Christ and Pop Culture. Cole has written an online exclusive television review for the Christian Research Journal, and his review is called Catharsis and the Power of Release in WandaVision. You can read his review at our website, Equip.org, if you are a subscriber to our magazine. Cole, it's good to have you on. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Well, as I mentioned, this will be a very spoiler-filled discussion of WandaVision that's on Disney+. And so if that is something that you don't like, then I would go ahead and watch WandaVision and then come back to our discussion. But um, I just wanted to first just talk a little bit about, you know, Disney in terms of, you know, this is not the Disney channel that's on cable. This is their new on-demand platform, kind of like competing with Netflix or Amazon Prime. And of course, they have bought up some very large franchises, Marvel and Star Wars. So they're starting to develop a ton of content. So this series is just finished and it was a series finale. It's not going to have like season, you know, two. And then a new Marvel series is starting up in two weeks. So um, as of this recording, so, you know, they, they continue to have more content for their platform. And so just for parents, you know, in the past, maybe we've always associated with Disney or certain companies, I guess, if we're still thinking about, you know, back in the day, 50 or 60 years ago, you know, with some of the classic Disney works, you know, the company and its content has evolved. So is it necessarily worth our money to, you know, be a subscriber to Disney Plus? Well, you know, the good thing about streaming now, uh, companies that have their own streaming companies now, uh, is that you sort of get their backlog as well. So you're getting the new content that they're producing, which which can be very varied, as we see with, with something like WandaVision, very different from what we're used to. But you, you're also getting... Uh, the back catalog. Uh, you're getting all the classics um, that, that go way back, like you said, you know, 50, 60 years ago. So if you have, um, you know, it's good for kids, I think, especially um, to catch some of those older TV shows or, or older, more timeless movies. Those are available too. So I guess it just depends on what you want out of it. If you want to get new stuff, that's an opportunity. If you want to catch the old stuff for not having to pay, you know, an outrageous amount of money to, to find some of these these movies that are back in the the Disney vault on DVDs and things like that, then yeah, you, you could probably drop a, what is it? Six 99 a month. I think they're upping it to seven 99 a month, something like that. If you're willing to drop seven, eight bucks a month on it. You'll have access to that. Yes. And I would just say for parents that because it's everything, it's the old and the new that you just, you know, approach series with discernment as you watch it with your kids or maybe look into it first, but specifically about WandaVision, it's this new, you know, what was really huge was the films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And now they're bringing some of those characters and, you know, even flashbacks to some of the movies into television series that they've developed specifically for these characters. And so it's kind of an interesting experiment within this universe because how they tell the story in this TV series is very creative and different. So could you tell us a little bit about the characters? Why is the title of the series WandaVision? What does that mean? And how were they originally introduced in the comics? Because these do have roots in all of the comics about these characters. Sure. So uh, WandaVision deals primarily with two characters from Marvel Comics. Uh, who were previously introduced in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Those characters are Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch, and another character known as Vision. Uh, Now, for the most part, the Marvel Cinematic Universe does quite a good job of updating certain characters while maintaining some measure of consistency with their comic book origins. 
With Scarlet Witch, however, the film version really sort of differs in important ways, at least in terms of origin. The character originally appeared in the X-Men comic books, created by Marvel legends Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Uh, She was originally introduced as a mutant, uh, which is always jarring to hear, right? If the only version of the character you're familiar with is the on-screen character portrayed by Elizabeth Olsen. You could almost say she's in the wrong film series. (laughs) Uh, But what's even more interesting is that until 2014, her canonical father in the source material in the comic books was none other than Magneto, the great X-Men villain played in the films by Ian McKellen and later by Michael Fassbender. Now, all of that sort of changed recently in 2014. Marvel revised her history in the comics to actually sort of line up with the film's version for her backstory, being born with these innate magical abilities and having had these certain uh, things augmented through genetic engineering. But that is pretty much Scarlet Witch and her comic book origins in a nutshell. She was originally a mutant, but had her backstory sort of updated. Now, the other main character, played by Paul Bettany, is Vision. The films hew a little more closely to his comic book backstory. He originally appeared in the late 60s in the Avengers comic book, built as a synthetic life form by the villain Ultron. He ultimately turns on Ultron, joins the Avengers, eventually marries the Scarlet Witch. So you can see the character template the cinematic universe makes use of quite clearly. So that's just a quick overview of both of these characters and their comic book origins. So what specifically makes WandaVision's approach to this series different or unique that, you know, was particularly creative? I think stylistically um, is probably the clearest example of just a really creative approach to the source material. For those who've seen the show, you know that the first thing to really be said is that it's it's probably not going to work for everybody, right? And I think the creators probably knew that going in. And for anybody who's not sure what we're talking about, the first handful of episodes of One Division are essentially in the style of older TV sitcoms. In fact, as the show continues, each episode sort of updates through certain eras of television. The first episode feels a lot like, you know, I Love Lucy or The Dick Van Dyke Show. We go forward, we see these little tributes to shows like The Brady Bunch, Full House, Malcolm in the Middle. And it's just a very clever approach to telling this particular story. That, in a lot of ways, immediately sets it apart from really anything else on television or on any streaming service right now. And it's certainly different and unexpected in regards to the broader Marvel Cinematic Universe. We've never really seen anything like this before, sort of going older to be new again. And that, at least for my money, is what makes it so at least novel in its approach. I definitely think that some of the TV series that are referenced, which is kind of like a little Easter egg you see in a later episode where she flashes back to her childhood where she's watching some of these shows with her family, is that maybe some of those classic shows will be introduced to a whole new generation. They might wonder, well, what are some of the shows that this was modeled after, like Bewitched or The Brady Bunch or Family Ties, you know, some of those classic sitcoms in kind of the heyday of television as it was getting started. So that's just an aside. It's interesting, though, that this show deals with certain subjects, like the subject of grief, which doesn't become really apparent until you get probably halfway through. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of this and how Christians should think about it? And I'll say, I watched this series and I am not a Marvel fan and I haven't watched the majority of the MCU film. So really, I was just going into it not knowing very much as I watched this series. Sure. So WandaVision is certainly unique in its approach from just a psychological standpoint. I think it does some pretty brave and interesting things with its central character. Wanda, by essentially turning her into a kind of anti-hero who is struggling to cope well with her grief. The show does a very good job of taking a character who sort of gets shortchanged by virtue of not having her own solo film, right? And sort of always having to play as part of a team. So there's not really a lot of time to develop her as a particular character. 
and then really giving her some depth across its nine episodes. I think the show humanizes her in some important ways, and it, it does so in a way that pretty much anybody who has ever lost anyone even remotely close to them can understand and sympathize with. And for anyone who's yet to watch the show, as, as you said, we'll be discussing spoilers here. So for example, the whole mystery that kicks off the show of sorts, uh, where the whole plot seems to be unfolding within a reality that in the context of the show is separate from the reality already established by the broader Marvel Cinematic Universe, is revealed to be this sort of false projection put forth by Wanda herself. Now, that's a very heady kind of storytelling. It requires careful viewing in order to follow the plot and a lot of patience, because the show is ruthless in not giving you answers up front. And it also demands that viewers already be familiar with the story of the broader Marvel Cinematic Universe, because when the show begins, Vision is supposed to be dead. And the show just drops you in. He's very much alive, and there's no real explanation. But by the show's end, the real emotional core of the thing rests with Wanda, who has taken over this town called Westview and basically placed everyone there under this kind of mind control. And she does all of this, uh, essentially creating a fantasy in which she quite literally forces other people to to participate in it, all because she is grieving, and uh, she's finally reached her her breaking point, um, specifically grieving the death of Vision, and it's all sort of spiraling out of this lifetime of of loss and, and tragedy, and it's finally reached a, a a climax. Now, you and I have talked some about what is being called cancel culture, which, ironically enough, is exactly what this sounds like, to me at least. Now, I, I seriously doubt the writers and creators intended the series to be taken that way. Nonetheless, I could not help but feel that what she is doing to those town people is exactly what a tangent of the broader culture does, particularly to people who don't share their ideology. You know, they, they stamp their feet when they don't get their way and demand that everyone participate in their fantasy. But as we know, there is no reality to that. And so the story of the show is Wanda coming to terms with her grief and accepting that she cannot go on clinging to her fantasy because it ultimately harms other people. Now that's a lesson worth learning, and it's a lesson that I certainly wish many Christians could learn as well. Uh, modern American church culture turns in no small part upon a fantasy. I don't particularly like to call it that. The better word for it is, I think, sentimentality, which we have talked about uh, in, in a couple other of the interviews we've done. Theologian Stanley Hauerwas has discussed this sort of thing at length, the idea that on any given Sunday, you and I are very likely to hear a sermon about how Christians are supposed to love the world and everyone in it, and it's going to be taught to us in a way that's not concrete. It's full of condescending platitudes and has absolutely no reality to it whatsoever. The point is that the modern American church can pay lip service to something like grief in appropriate moments, like a funeral per se, but the real experience of grief is something that we work very hard to excise. It's something that we do not count as a normative part of the Christian experience, and in a culture that is already consumed by consumerism, to suggest such a thing as loss or grief is to defy the established categories of what Christianity is, despite the fact that the Bible speaks very profoundly in both Testaments about strong emotions like grief and loss and longing. Some might even say that it is the dominant emotion of the entire Bible next to love. The New Testament especially is full of that kind of language regarding the life of the Christian, the language of persevering through suffering uh, in books like James and Timothy. So to have a mainstream show that looks so thoroughly at a topic like grief in this particular culture is, I think, a, a bold storytelling decision. And the way the church handles grief and loss is definitely an area in which I think criticism is fair in most cases, even deserved in some. 
but for the person with a crystal clear understanding of suffering being almost a hallmark of the Christian life, I think a show like One Division offers great evangelistic and even apologetic value. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Cole Burgett, who has written an online exclusive television series review for the Christian Research Journal. His review is called Catharsis and the Power of Release in WandaVision. You can read his article at our website, equip.org, if you're a subscriber to our magazine. Now, I mentioned being a subscriber to our magazine to be able to read his article, and that's because one of the exclusive benefits for our subscribers is early access to these online exclusive articles like the one Cole has written for us. So to subscribe to the journal, if you're not already a subscriber, just go to equip.org and a subscription is $33.50. Another way you can partner with us, really the best way, is to get the word out about this podcast. Please tell your friends about all of our content, and you can link this podcast on any of your social media accounts to share the content with your friends. And another way that you can share this content with people that are looking for content like this is to rate and review our podcast, which you can do at Apple Podcasts, where you can give us a starred review or a short one to two sentence review about what you like about the podcast there. Or you can do that wherever you get your podcasts. And another way you can help us is just to give us a donation, a tip for all of this podcast episodes that we bring you every week that is completely free to you. And you can give us a tip at our website, equip.org, by going to Postmodern Realities Podcast, which you will find under the magazine tab at that drop-down menu, and you can hit any landing page for any episode, and you can give us a tip there. And we appreciate all the ways in which you partner with us. And if you are thinking about giving us a review, and you've been thinking about it and thinking about it, just haven't done it, go ahead and go on to Apple Podcasts really quick and just write a brief review about what you like about this content. And thank you. You were just talking about grief and how in modern evangelicalism, a lot of times we don't really grapple what the Bible teaches about grief. And I do think that in terms of apologetic value, there is something there, especially if you're talking to people who aren't religious as like, how do they deal with grief? I mean, you look at how did Wanda deal with grief? And then to talk about who Christ was and how he dealt with grief, especially when we think of the story of when he went to see Mary and Martha and Lazarus had died. And in that context, Jesus does weep because he knows that death, physical death, is not what we were originally created for. And there's so much brokenness in that. And so, you know, not to, you know, get into specifically that story in the Gospels, but there is a lot there because how she responds to grief is not how the Bible talks to us about grief. And yet the Bible is very real about what it feels like to grieve. When you look in the Psalms, for instance, in the Old Testament, and David is praying about his grief. And so I think that's one good thing, like you said, about this grief, especially at the end. You know, I did find the last few episodes, and particularly, I think it was the finale, very, um, like I said, I don't have any attachment to these Marvel characters, but I did find it very touching about what she had to do in order to really come to terms with her grief and then also realize how she was harming others. Yeah, that's sort of the the, the crux the show turns upon, right? You, you know, the, the story goes, you, you don't really have a a story at all until you have a character who comes through some kind of emotional arc. And that is Wanda's emotional arc, essentially learning that you can, in a sense, escape into a fantasy, but it oftentimes it does more harm, not only to yourself, but to other people. The quick and easier way is not always the best way. Uh, that's the idea. Well, we talked just a little bit about the homage that it does and how creative that was to classic television series like The Dick Van Dyke Show, which I don't think I've ever seen The Dick Van Dyke Show. And I think there are some elements to me also of, I know they were specifically referencing The Dick Van Dyke Show, but I also 
thought of I Love Lucy and the neighbor that comes over that, you know, talks to Lucy and stuff like that. So what do you think of how WandaVision made use of this particular strategy of, you know, framing the series? Did you think it was effective? Well, you know, the question is, does it work? And and I mean, I, I think a large part of that is up to personal taste. If you are not a fan of sitcoms or you don't have any kind of appreciation for old school television, you're probably going to struggle with a good bit of WandaVision. But if you have fond memories of a certain era of television and don't mind taking a trip through TV history, particularly through the lens of sitcoms, then I think you're going to be in for a a real treat. WandaVision is technically very well made. The use of aspect ratio, right? That's just those black bars on the top and bottom of the screen, uh, as well as types of camera movement are all used very intelligently to evoke a certain old school feel. And then it's changed to a more modern approach when certain things happen that lets you know things in the sitcom world aren't quite what they seem. Uh, I do think the most interesting thing that creators and writers did was was to tie the sitcom style to the narrative, right? They actually do a, a very good job of giving narrative reasons regarding why Wanda's mental projections manifest themselves as things like sitcoms. And the reason for that is essentially these are the kinds of shows that she would, would grow up watching, that she watched with, with vision. And so the show riffs on this idea that in those moments of grief, we tend to fall back on nostalgia and familiarity uh, for comfort. So yeah, I think it worked. I, I enjoyed seeing it. I, I I sort of like older sitcoms. I don't really advertise it, but I watch shows like Sanford and Son and The Golden Girls. I think they're they're good fun. Uh, but then to go a step further and actually build in narrative reasons for that, I, I think was uh, it's a sign of writers who care and try to do things intelligently. Now, I do want to ask you about the characters themselves, because two of the main characters, both the villainess and the villain, I guess, and Wanda, are witches. And in the past, Christians have been very uh, reticent to interact with any pop culture shows or movements. You know, think back to the days in the 80s with D&D and so forth. But they were very just wanting to avoid those kinds of things because of the subject matter. But I will say that in my social media feed, a huge proponent of Christians were watching this show. And some of it, you know, goes back to the days of witch trials in Salem and not in historic sense, but they kind of, you know, and then they show various incantations and spells and things, which would have been anathema in the past. So why do you think Christians are a little bit more embracing, hey, this is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, even though it's a witch. And so I will definitely watch the show. Yeah, this is a good question. I think you kind of have to go back in in history a little bit to sort of understand it, where, you know, uh, cultural taboos, if that's what we want to call them, change with time. And I think with regards to this particular subject matter, things like Harry Potter played no small part in that changing sort of the, uh, the cultural whims, if you will. Ultimately, though, I think because I, I do encounter people every now and then, especially in the area where I'm from, who would still have serious concerns about something like this. If, if they even hear the idea that there's a witch in the show, regardless of context, right? Regardless of how the character is being used in the narrative, they're out. And that's, you know, that's fair. If that's where they are, that's fair. That being said, I think as with any any story, any book, anything you're reading, I think you have to be very careful in terms of reading a book or or viewing a show in in terms of letting the narrative set its own context. Uh, And like you mentioned, you have two characters in, in this particular show who are, for all intents and purposes, witches. One of them very much explicitly so, going back, like you said, to the days of, of Salem and the witch trials there. But I never get the sense that this show is trying to force, in a sense, these ideologies on its viewers. So if the question I'm being asked is, do you think this is going to influence my child towards witchcraft? Then the answer is probably going to be no. I think they're probably going to be more influenced towards sitcoms or uh, uh, superheroes. That being said, I don't think we should turn a blind eye to it, and I think it opens the door for conversations about 
what is this imagery that the show is using? Uh, things like uh, runes or, or glyphs or, or whatever you want to call them. What is this imagery that the show is, in a sense, appropriating to use to tell its story? Those are conversations to be had. They're important conversations to be had. And it doesn't even have to happen with your kids or with your parents. It can happen with you know, non-Christians or people who are just curious in general with what's going on or why a Christian would even bother watching something like this. So I think we have to be careful viewers, careful thinkers. We have to pay attention to context. And in that sense, I feel like this is a relatively harmless show. You did talk about earlier just you know these different ways in which fantasy versus reality is portrayed in WandaVision and that it's making points about maybe the dangers of nostalgia and, and, and familiarity. Talk a little bit more about that. Why should Christians even care about some of those issues, the ideas of fantasy versus reality? Well, as we talked about before, things like nostalgia and familiarity are very close to sentimentality. Now, we have to sort of be careful here because it is a bit of a nuanced discussion. Now, sentimentality, I would characterize as not a good thing. It's very detached from reality. Nostalgia is a little different in that it isn't always bad. Nostalgia is the thing we say Thomas Kincaid paintings capture, <laughs> when what we really mean is Thomas Kincaid paintings double down on sentimentality. I can talk about this because we had a huge Kincaid hanging in our house when I was a kid. It was a picture of Carmel by the Sea, California. And if you've ever checked out a Kincaid, it's usually this cozy mountain cottage lost in time that looks warm and inviting. And, and this... Uh, this world captured by this painting is, is clearly a simpler time that has absolutely no problems in it whatsoever. Sentimentality. Now, nostalgia is a little different. It looks back on fonder memories, but it can typically account for things like grief, for example, which sentimentality cannot, although the two are usually closely linked because of the emotional response that they evoke. And that, in a way, is the genius of WandaVision. The writers and creators essentially use TV nostalgia, which is a very real thing, right? Uh, find someone over the age of 60 and ask them about old TV westerns, for example. And you know, chances are they're going to be able to tell you the kind of TV they had, what their house was like, on and on it goes. Well, the WandaVision writers actually take that. They take that. TV nostalgia, and they use it very cleverly against viewers, right? Because the point of the show is to sort of suggest that if you're not careful, you can allow yourself to become trapped by sentimentality, pulling others into this fantasy of yours just so you don't have to experience any kind of grief or repercussions for your own actions. And in a very real sense, Wanda is the person who runs back to her old TV, kicks it on, and becomes absorbed in that world so that she doesn't have to come to terms with the fact that her life has been one of tragedy and that she needs to deal with that. I mean, in the real world, Wanda would, what she really needs is a friend to tell her that she should probably go and get therapy. <laughs> so there's a fine line between nostalgia and sentimentality. One of them looks back on memories fondly but clearly. The other, we would say sentimentality, recasts reality as this sort of gummed up version of the truth. I have a good friend who calls sentimentality the syruping up of truth. I think that's a wonderful expression. I love that expression. It turns everything sweet, but in a way that has no real depth whatsoever. It, it's like an airbrush painting, right? The sentimental person can gloss over tragedy like it's nothing, and that's a real problem. Ironically enough, I have one friend who calls sentimentality in the context of the church. He calls it the Disney-fied version of the Christian life, the notion that nothing bad happens in the end. But in order to be faithful to the Bible, there are certain things that we have to acknowledge, like evil, bad things that demand justice, the existence of hell even. You mentioned the Psalms. I mean, you, you read the Psalms, and the most common type of Psalm you're going to find is lament. 
the Bible story is not one that ends entirely in hellfire and brimstone. There is a new creation, after all. However, God's wrath goes forth, and justice is served. So I don't necessarily think there is anything inherently wrong with nostalgia, but we have to be careful not to stumble over into sentimentality and airbrush all the problems of our history or our pasts away. Otherwise, how are we to learn from our mistakes? Well, I just want to end and ask you a question about overall your impressions of this show. Now, Entertainment Weekly did a review of it, and they called WandaVision a postmodern love story. So do you think that that's a fair description of this series or is it trying to critique what this actually is? I mean, is there any there there when it comes to WandaVision at, in the end? I want to be careful how I answer this particular question. Um, again, it's, it's a bit of a nuanced discussion, but I think what Entertainment Weekly probably means when they say it's a postmodern love story is that the style of the show is what the kids these days call meta, right? It sort of takes the idea of Wanda and Vision having a connection through these old TV shows and, in a sense, retroactively building a romance off of that. Now, does that make the show postmodern? Well, whatever that means. You know, when the self-professing postmodern scholars can't even agree on what postmodernity actually is, then, then maybe it doesn't exist, at least not in the way some Christian scholars like to suggest that it does. Uh, postmodern, and you know, this is just my opinion, postmodern is one of those words that people tend to say because it sounds intelligent. It's what I call a $5 word. But if you ask someone to actually define what postmodernity is, you're going to get a really wide variety of answers, and not all of them are going to be interrelated. And I'll be honest, I don't think our culture is postmodern in the sense that the word itself would suggest. In other words, I don't think we have moved beyond modernity. And just to be clear, these are terms that like philosophers or people who take themselves like too seriously like to use to describe the cultural moment in which we find ourselves. And a lot of well-meaning Christians latch onto this as a way of explaining some of the contradictions that seem widespread in the culture. And I'll concrete this a little bit because it's going to tie back into one division, and, and I want to be clear on what I'm saying. For example, we might say that no one believes in absolute truth anymore. That's sort of how you hear postmodernity cast in things like Bible colleges and seminaries. I know because I've done both. They'll say, well, people just live however they want to live. Therefore, they're postmodern people. Well, that's a really broad generalization. And that's really not unique to this cultural moment, right? People have always just kind of lived how they want to live. And also, of course, people believe in absolutes of some form. The reason Bob, for example, lives the way he does, and then he doesn't live like Bill, is because Bob believes he's more right than Bill. Otherwise, he would live like Bill. So when someone says, this is postmodern or whatever, it doesn't really make sense to me. So in terms of one division being called a postmodern love story, I certainly think it's intentionally clever writing by the creators of the show, by means of both inverting and subverting established sitcom tropes to make a point about sentimentalizing the past and what happens when we choose to indulge in fantasy rather than face reality. So you, your question was, is there any there there? That's the there. It makes a point about what happens when we sentimentalize the past and choose to indulge in fantasy rather than face reality. Now, a truly postmodern show would do things for no reason, and the reasonlessness and the meaninglessness would be the end of it. But that's not how stories work, that's not how plot works, that's not how people think, nor is it how people live. If anything, and I think one division comes out very clearly in this regard due to stuff we've already talked about, especially the witchcraft, if anything, I think we're a post-secular culture, not postmodern. To suggest we're postmodern suggests that we've moved beyond the trappings of modernity and all of this scientific and religious and esoteric nonsense. We've grown beyond that. We're postmodern. But we haven't. I mean, one main character of the show is called the Scarlet Witch, and the other is a machine born of unnatural science. I mean, there's no more modernistic take 
on this than the supremacy of science to birth an intelligent life like vision. And the whole big reveal of the last part of the season, as you mentioned, revolves around witches and magic, which is about as esoteric of a concept as you can possibly get. So I don't think we've moved beyond modernity. We have moved beyond secularism. The world has woken up and realized that you actually can't get rid of religion or the unknown or these more supernatural ideas and that science doesn't solve all of our problems. And we've come back around to embracing ideas like religion. So we've moved beyond secularism. So I don't know that I would say one division is a postmodern anything, but I would definitely say it is a very clear case of a post-secular TV show whose main protagonist and main antagonist are witches, and the main protagonist's love interest is an artificial intelligence. So it's a post-secular love story, I would say. Well, I wouldn't say that WandaVision has received a lot of critical acclaim. I mean, I think everybody would agree where we landed that the vehicle to tell the story through these classic television series is clever. So if this is not really, you know, a viewer's bag, and and then maybe they might be concerned, even though it doesn't have any deep meaning, perhaps, to the witch, the main characters being witches. Is there another superhero series that you could recommend people to go after this one while we're waiting for the next one about the Falcon? And I I mean, again, I'm I'm not uh, into the Marvel Universe, but Sony named Falcon, that's coming up. And the Winter Soldier, right? Falcon and Winter Soldier, is that what it's called? That's it, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Yeah, so that's coming. I guess if you're looking for another new superhero show to get your fix, the CW just started uh, Superman and Lois. And I happened to catch the first episode of it, and I thought it was, was quite quite well done. Well, that can be something for viewers to look towards while they wait for their next Marvel outing. So finally, on a much lighter note, I want to ask some fun rapid-fire questions, as usual, to Cole. So chicken, beef, or vegetarian? Uh, toss up between chicken and beef. Probably chicken. And when you go grocery shopping, is it? Paper, plastic, or do you bring your own bags? Now, I know some of it's changed the pandemic, but in pre-pandemic times, I guess. Where I go, it's usually paper. And do you do self-checkout, or do you like to go old school with cashier? I go old school with the cashier. I don't trust myself. (laughs) (laughs) And would you rather do dishes or laundry? Oh, wow, dishes. Rather do dishes. Well, thanks, Cole, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Uh, It's always a pleasure to talk to you. You've been listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest has been Cole Bridget, who has written an online exclusive television series review for the journal, and his review is called Catharsis and the Power of Release in WandaVision. You can read his article at our website, equip.org, if you're a subscriber to our magazine. We'd like to connect to you, so please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man YouTube channel and join in the conversation in the comment section and in the live chat when we have premiere videos. Please follow the Bible Answer Man page on Facebook and on Twitter. You will find us at Hank Hanegraaff, Bible Answer Man, Christian Research Institute, and Christian Research Journal, as well as on Instagram at the Bible Answer Man account. You won't want to miss every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern when we live stream the Bible Answer Man broadcast, hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff at our website, equip.org. In addition, please subscribe to the Hank Unplugged podcast. Hank gets out of the studio and into his study and engages in in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations on critical issues with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people on the planet. You'll want to head on over to Equip.org because there you're going to find thousands of free resources for you in articles and past broadcasts, our podcasts, and videos. And thank you for all the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. Mm-hmm.